Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Our Kids Play Hockey. We want to let you know that we have once again been honored with a nomination for the Hockey Podcast of the Year via the Sports Podcasting Awards. And all you need to do to help us is go to OurKidsPlayHockey.com and click on the Vote Now button. It asks you a couple questions. You're in and you're out, and you have voted for us for Hockey Podcast of the Year. I want to thank you all for being a wonderful, wonderful audience and helping us get to this stature of hockey podcasting because we've done it as a family, as the hockey friends and families around the world. Thanks so much and enjoy this episode of Our Kids Play Hockey. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. Got a special guest today, Mike Weaver, played 11 years in the NHL, undrafted. Uh, person that joined the NHL, played for Michigan State. Really great conversation about a few things. Uh, one, his journey to the NHL. We go through a lot of great tips and tactics uh, from, you know, smite all the way through, uh, uh, sorry, 18U, I got to say that correctly, uh, for defensemen. Really gives a great perspective on the position of defense and how he approached the game. And then most importantly, how he approached life and how he was always prepared throughout his entire career playing and even before in college. Uh, for life after hockey, which is something that we talk about a lot on the show. So really valuable hour of your time to listen to Mike Weaver, a great conversation. Um, also want to let you know today's episode is brought to you by the new book that Christy Casciano Burns and I wrote called When Hockey Stops. It's available now for free sale at whenhockeystops.com. If you're a fan of this show, you're going to love this book. It, it follows a player whose season ends early because of a broken wrist, and we go through all the adversity that he has to face um, with his team about not being able to play and what he has to do in order to find his way back to the game and stay involved when he can't actually play. Um, so check that out, whenhockeystops.com, um, and you get some pretty cool gifts uh, before the holidays if you pre-order it now. But otherwise, enjoy this uh, episode with Mike Weaver, uh, the man who invented coachthem.com. It's a great one, and uh, have a great one, everybody. Hello, hockey friends and families around the world, and welcome to another edition of Our Kids Play Hockey. I'm Lee Elias. That's Mike Benelli. Christy Casciano Burns is on assignment today, but we are joined by former NHL defenseman Mike Weaver. Mike's NHL career spent 11 seasons where he spent time with the Thrashers, the Kings, the Canucks, the Blues, the Panthers, and the Canadiens, and a collegiate career with the Michigan State uh, team from 1996 to 2000. Mike is a self proclaimed ex NHLer turned techie. And he is also the founder of CoachThem.com, which is a platform that allows hockey coaches to build their playbook and plan for practice online. Definitely check that out. It's a really awesome resource. We'll talk about it later in the show. But for now, Mike, wonderful to have you here. Welcome to Our Kids Play Hockey. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Lee. No, the, hey, the pleasure is always ours, man. I'm, I'm amazed at the people we get on this show. I mean, look, Mike, Mike Benelli was a fine. I'm not going to lie to you. Christy's a fine. But, Mike, you being here today is real special. So, before we get into it and your time in the NHL, uh, I want you to tell us about your youth hockey journey all the way through your scholarship to Michigan State, because it, it's an amazing journey. And, uh, it, you know, it, we'll, we'll see how, how it culminates to a trip to the NHL. Yeah, well, for sure. Um, one of the amazing things is I never thought I was going to make it. <laughs> um, and, and that's something that everybody wishes Um that, that they can make it and it's and to be honest it, it's it's a it was turned into kind of a lifestyle and that that's it can't be a sometimes thing it was an it was an everyday thing so a lot of the teams I played for don't exist anymore which is kind of crazy so I ended up playing Chinkuzi, uh, uh which doesn't exist uh, Brampton uh, Maroons doesn't exist I went to uh, Richmond Hill Vaughn Kings they ended up uh, bringing me over there and they ended up taking the the boundaries and they put it around my house they, in order for me to come over to that association wow. we ended up winning the all Ontarios that year it was pretty crazy then from uh, Lindsay Hofford was was my coach at the time and he was the assistant GM of uh, uh, Phoenix uh, he's uh, very well uh, known here in the hockey world in Toronto uh, then from there I uh, went to uh, Thor uh, Thornhill Islanders doesn't exist uh, junior a tier two um, it, it was kind of crazy. Mike York, uh, ex NHLer. Yeah. Uh, there was a few guys, uh, Chris Heron. There's five of us. They called us the Young Guns. We're so underagers playing on a line together with New A. And it was pretty, pretty cool. Then we went to Bramley Blues. Doesn't exist. <laughs> 
Uh, and then I don't like this. I don't like this theme right now that you're on uh, our kids play <laughs> no. hockey. Mike, so, I mean, <laughs> it, well, it's, it's just getting started. Then, right. I went to, <laughs> then, then I uh, went to school in Michigan state that, that exists. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, so I, I, I ended up, I, I was always, um, interested. I, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I basically took this test that told me I wanted to get into computers. So instead of me taking basket weaving courses, like a lot of the guys do, I was, I ended up doing a lot of weight. I didn't want to just go because back then the, the computers weren't kind of where they are today. Right. So this, I this ended is 96 up 96 to 2000, just to give context. To yeah. You. 96 yeah. to 2000. So yeah, inter like, internet's not even really there yet at that point. No. I mean, it's, it, it exists, but it's not, not there yet. AOL well, instant messenger, maybe prodigy. Yeah. So <laughs> telecommunication degree, I, I, my minor is basically custom, a minor in virtual reality, software development, web design. Like I, like I, I had uh, 3D uh, virtual reality. I was, I, I created a beach ball, um, uh, a garbage can, and I was able to fly around these these cities. It was pretty cool back then that I was able to do all that stuff. So then, I, then I ended up um, undrafted. Uh, Atlanta Thrashers was the NHL team that uh, that drafted me. Doesn't exist Doesn't anymore. Exist, yeah. uh, the, <laughs> They're up in Winnipeg. The, the, the minor league team. The, I, I ended up, I remember going to training camp and we were there and Don Waddell was the GM. He pulled all the rookies into it. And he's just like, just to let you know, guys, you guys are going to go down to the minors and you're going to learn how to be professional, which, which really, really stuck with me because um, you could learn from everybody. And, and, and a lot of things that happen in hockey you you could relate to to the real everyday life. Um, there's a lot of lessons. You just got to have your eyes open. So I ended up going there and and down to the IHL International Hockey League doesn't exist uh, with the Orlando Solar Bears. That kind of doesn't exist anymore. They came back as the East Coast uh, yeah. team, but it's um, amazing um, jerseys that team. Put, by the way, they, they always had oh, amazing I, I jerseys. Have, I have. I yeah. have. The, the hat, the solar bear, I just found the right. solar bear. <laughs> it's uh, it was like purple, red, blue. It was all over the place that day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was a polar bear with sunglasses. Right, on. right. It's pretty cool. But um, yeah, so I ended up going down there. We won the, we won the, ended up winning the Turner Cup, uh, the last ever Turner Cup. Uh, then I, w we went to uh, the AHL uh, after that defunct. Uh, I went to the Chicago Wolves, which they exist. Uh, we won, won the Calder Cup the following year. So it was pretty amazing, those two situations that happened. But um, when I was in the NHL, it was crazy. I was designing websites for local uh, businesses. So that's because I was always trying to figure out, like, what the, what, what, what's next? Right. And, and that's kind of what you have to do on the ice. You have to go and think about what's next. And, and the way that I kind of the way that I kind of did things and kind of going into the, the hockey part of it, I, I thought the game more than uh, better than, than most. And a lot of people would just go and focus on the puck. If you were to ask any person watching the TV, what are you looking at? They're like, Oh, we're looking at the guy with the puck. But if I was able to figure out the other four guys without the puck, what their options were, not just where they are, what their options are, I was able to basically tell the future. And if I was able to tell the future in everyday life, I would, I, I would know what the lottery ticket is <laughs> and I'd be absolutely just massively uh, rich. Um, but it's, yeah, that, that's kind of the way that I kind of thought about things. And, and, and I was always looking for the next big thing. So then I ended up from there, I ended up creating a hockey school and I started teaching the thinking part of the game. Um, and then I found it very tedious to go and draw drills and re completely do it over and over again. So I ended up creating a company called coach them. And, uh, I'm, it's pretty amazing. Every day I wake up and I, I pop out of bed. I'm up till about 12 midnight. Uh, I'm up at 5.00 AM, uh, working with our developers. Uh, so it's, it's pretty cool. It's been, it's been an amazing, amazing journey. What I love about your description of your journey, and, and if Christy was here, she would she would really emphasize this too, is that your educational journey and your entrepreneurial journey is almost equal to your hockey journey. And I love that you merge those together because we talk about on this show all the time 
how at the end of the day, hockey is a vehicle for your growth as a, as a person, right? And how the game teaches you, uh, if you go into entrepreneurship, how to be a great entrepreneur or business owner, but really wherever you go, it teaches you those little nicks and knacks about being on a team. I love that you talked about um, knowing what the other four guys on the ice were doing, because that's something that's insanely underrated, right? Underappreciated. I mean, we typically look skill first and not cerebral, right? Um, and I, I love that you played that way. And and again, it, it, obviously the fact that you're involved in coaching is not a surprise at all the way you just described yourself. You, you described the game as a coach when you played. But I do want to talk about um, you being undrafted and making the NHL, Mike. And this is important for, I think, our parents to hear and our coaches. Because, look, the, the dream journey to the NHL is first overall pick or, you know, you're a draft pick and you go and you have a great career. And in reality, it's insanely rare, right? Uh, you took the hard road and made it. And I love that. And I want you to describe for the parents and the coaches listening uh, this from multiple points of view, the work you had to put in when people were not looking at you. You had a college career, obviously, but what did you have to do to stand out? I love also, uh, by the way, I want to reiterate this, that you brought up the minors because uh, that's also something people don't think about. Some of the greatest players we've ever heard of started in the minors and they learned, as you said, how to be a pro in the minors, right? Great organizations typically do not rush players to the forefront. The players ready, that's one thing, but you don't rush talent. You, you develop it, you bring it forward. And I, again, you were a champion at those levels. I'm sure that absolutely contributed to you having success at the NHL level. So again, that was a lot of questions in one. I apologize. I'm just yeah, kind of excited about I'm this. Trying to, I'm trying to write yeah. them down right now. No, that's my fault. So I'll, I'll, I'll bring it back. You're, you were undrafted. You made the show. You know, tell me about that experience, the, the work you had to put in and everything you had to do to, to, to make it to the NHL. Okay, so one, one really amazing um, article that I wrote is called Tales of the Undrafted Puck Eater. It's on, it's on the Players' Tribune. And it is, uh, it basically kind of, in a nutshell, shows exactly um, kind of how 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 I made it and how I, it came to be me playing at NHL. I remember one of the things that my dad uh, in there, I mentioned that I was, I was at a draft. I went to both my draft years uh, in the NHL and my second, my last one. So the uh, we're getting back then they, they had like every, every round and it would right. take like hours and hours. You'd be sitting there and you would go for lunch and then you would come back and, so I remember we're getting close to the last couple guys and we're walking up the stairs and my dad's just like, let's go, let's go. Um, and I'm like, well, I just kind of wanted, I paused and I wanted to hear the last guy dropped it because I just wanted to, I just wanted to know. And it wasn't me, obviously. And I turned to my dad and my dad said, he's just like, find another way. And it, it really stuck with me because it's, it's, a lot of people try and go down one path and there are roadblocks and they keep on trying to get past this roadblock. They try to like trying to bang it and cut it down and blow it up. And, and it's, it's just, there's other ways to go. So just take another path. Right. Um, so that's kind of what I did. I ended up, uh, the, my whole career, I was told that I was too short. Right. especially back then in 2000, when I made it, uh, you have to be six feet, at least minimum as a defenseman. Um, and I basically pucks for a living. So for me not to be able to score goals and, and, and it's, it was very difficult for me to make it, but, um, but it was, yeah, it's, I, I think I was always evolving my game. And I was, um, I was learning, I was learning from other people. And, and a lot of people are just so stuck in, in, um, in caulking, like I know everything. And, and I think the, the, the smartest players out there are the ones that are always evolving the platform, involving them as a person and on the ice and off the ice. And, and understanding that, understanding that there's always somebody better, smarter, than you and if you're able to get one or two things from those individuals that it's going to improve you uh, as a as, as a person uh, both on and off the ice 
Yeah, Mike, I, I want to, I want to just, uh, so I know I've known in full disclosure, I've been really following Mike Weaver for a number of years now. I mean, I love the defensive side of the game. I think what Mike talks about the cerebral part and, 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 and maturing and finding other paths to get there. Mike, I want you to talk a little bit about, cause this is really something I'm passionate about when you speak and listening to you talk to young defensemen and about, you know, undersized, that's fine. Even, you know, but if you're oversized, no matter what you are in your stature from a defensive point of view, you still have to know the game and where your strengths and weaknesses can lie. And I think maybe you could talk a little bit about from a youth hockey's perspective, because most of our audience is youth hockey parents and coaches and players that, you know, what are some principles that you believe in from a, as a defenseman that defensemen need to understand about thinking the game like where do you want to be as opposed to where the opposition is where do you want to where do you want to uh, how do you influence the game based off of what you do not the old you know reading and reacting you know not reacting to play but what what are some you know tips that you can give coaches and players to understand that it's not you can't always be reacting to somebody else you need to influence the play in order to continue to evolve your game yeah, you never you never want to chase because you, when you're chasing, you're at a disadvantage. You want to take back control. So reading and reacting to what that player is doing is you're, you're out of control. It's all about taking back control in the game. And that's what I teach at Defense First Hockey School I, uh, that I have in Toronto. Um, I teach the taking back control. So it's all about initiate and dictate. It's you putting your yourself in a position that you're able to take back control. And it's, it's kind of, you got to think of where you want to get that player. And, and that's, that's the way that you got to think is it's not, yeah, sure. You want to stop them now, but you want to go and get that player to, to that area. So how are you going to do it? Are you going to be like, Oh, do you mind going over here? No, they're not going to do that. But players got to understand that they are influencing. You influence an individual to go to those different areas. So obviously, if you like, for, for instance, if you are standing by the boards and you want to force the, the forward that's coming on you down the boards, well, the guy's not a ghost and he can't go through you. So if we're able to go in and move towards the middle a little bit more, right. It, it allows you create more space and say, here, here you go. And then we take it away. And, and it's a lot of players just don't have a plan in mind. They don't, they, they just go and react. And it's something that if you are able to outthink the, the opponent, it really changes the game. It's kind of like an aha moment that you're just like, Oh my God, like, I'm able to influence that person to that area. And, and then, and then it changes your whole entire, it's like almost the, the, the old movie, the matrix, all of a sudden you're just like, like once you figure it out, it's just like, wow. So one little pointer I'll give is position yourself and putting, uh, go, so here, let, let's just break it down. So, I look at, I teach my kids based on the highway. So if the kids are in the car with their, with their parents and they're on the highway and on the boards, there's the fast lane, move it the next lane over the medium speed lane. And then you got the slow lane, right? Now you got these different lanes here. And if all of a sudden you, the, the kids are coming down with the parents, I ask the kids, I'm like, Hey, I'm like, if I'm in the fast lane and I'm going slow, what does your parents say? If somebody's going slow on the, on the highway and the parent kids are like, oh, they would scream and yell and tell them to go to town. Um, and, <laughs> and what would they do? And the kids are like, oh, they would change lanes. I'm like, okay, so they're going to change lanes. They're going to go to the middle, but we don't want them to go in the middle. So why not go and go into the medium or the slow lane and basically us being there and allows them to maintain their speed and, and getting them happy. 
right? Then we're able to take it away. So it's, it's kind of like you got to almost put it in real life situations for the kids. And, and one of the most important things that all of a sudden, once I figured this out, is what is the opposition player trying to do? Yeah, trying to do, score. Do you know, do you know this? <laughs> well, Benali, you know this. Lee, do you know this? What is the opposition, opposition player. player trying to do? Well, hopefully they're trying to manipulate you too. <laughs> they're playing right. Yeah, but what are they trying to what, what's what are they trying to do? They're trying to score or create an opportunity. And that's what all the kids say. They're trying to right. score. Right. But what are they trying to do? It's right in the name. It's right in the name. Well, move it forward. <laughs> opposition player. They want trying to go opposite of you. I'm gonna keep the gotcha. I'm gonna keep the, the I'm gonna keep the discussion going quick. So they want to oppose you. <laughs> yeah well exactly exactly they want to go opposite of you so if you think right. about that it changes the whole entire game well, i mean think right. about this mike i mean one of the one of the pieces here that i think I, I just want to hit on just one last piece because of so many years you played in the nhl there's absolutely no way you could have done that if you were the first guy in the corner chasing after pucks and battle and using your body all the time right mm -hmm. so talk from a defensive point of view from, from any size defense, but it doesn't even matter size because it's all about longevity and ultimately getting possession of the puck and, and manipulating the opposition by putting them in an area, in a box where you can now control them. I mean, so what are some of those influences and cues that you would give for players to know, like, listen, you don't need to be the first one on the puck in the corner. You need to be the smartest one going after the puck. And I think... You know, that's where I think young defensemen want to go, go, go. Like they want to be the first one to get a puck and then they get there and they put themselves in the corner and they don't come out with it. Right. So what are the, what are some of the strategies you can give, you know, without giving away defense first. And I'm sure we could put mm. the website up there so everybody can join your hockey school. But I think, <laughs> but, but I think, but I think the, the little nuances of what that takes for a player um, to approach those situations. Yeah. Well, I think, I think, um, you got to understand that your your stick is is a very vital piece of the whole um, whole puzzle. Um, your stick, even though it's a stick, it's actually like a wall. It's like a door, right? Uh, it's like, it's like a wall, and then basically to the right of you, that's the door. A player, if I all of a sudden everybody would is easily able to walk through an open door, right? But if, if I close the door and I put my stick over here, I close the door, well, right. a player's not gonna wanna go through the closed door, they're gonna go through the open door. So if you think about this, when as you're approaching that player in the corner, you gotta understand that that player is trying to go opposite of you. So they are, you're influencing by, if you go straight at him, well, that guy has choices, go right or left. If you're able to go, I want that guy to go over here. See, like a lot of people don't have that, that thinking part of it, that they're just like, oh, I gotta get, get the puck. Right. Instead of saying, I want that guy to go there. So instead of me going straight, that gives it the up my disadvantage to the player. I'm able to go to the left a little bit with my stick, and then I'm able to influence him into the corner. Right. It's your approach. It's your approach to the, to the guy, like on a one-on-one, -on -one, if a player gets the middle, I tell my players, well, because you gave them the middle. That's the only reason why they're getting the middle is because you gave them the middle. It's, it's, it's all about influence. It, the whole, the whole game changes when you think about that. It's all about influence. It, it, it's all about the approach that, that opposition player is, is basically trying to figure out how to get by you and they're trying to go opposite of you. So Mike, I, I think when you look at some of the, the greatest of all time, and I'm not even just talking offense here, I'm talking positionally, they have the ability to do that on an incredible level. You know, one of the things I love about what you're talking about too um, is that one of the things I did when I was young, so I started playing late and I, I, uh, in a, in a, in a, in a parallel kind of way to you, I had to figure out, right. I got to find a way like your dad said to you, it's totally true. And I remember um, I could always skate, but I, I had major problems scoring. I wasn't seeing the ice like I wanted to. So they part started putting me into like, you know, um, scoring clinics and all these clinics. 
And it really wasn't doing anything for me. So I said, I got to find a different way. So what I started to do, I went to goaltending clinics and started to volunteer as a shooter. Because I'm thinking if I can figure out how a goalie thinks, I can start to influence them. And then I started going to the defensive clinics because I want to learn how a defenseman thinks. So when I'm coming down as a center, which I played, I can start to think about how they're thinking. I also like to expand upon, like, there's levels to what you're talking about, right? So I love about stick leading and making sure you can kind of manipulate or influence a player. And there's other things too, like, and again, at the NHL level, this is probably not as important, but at a youth level, you can see if a guy's left or right-handed, I want to put him on his backhand. So I try and influence that player towards their backhand, and that can change the entire course of a play. Um, Mike, before we move on, because I do have another question on, on the defenseman stuff, um, I want to throw a question back at you too, because your journey to the show, um, I love that you shared that with us first off, by the way. And I love that you told that story. It's really powerful about find another way. Um, I'll ask this to both of you. Do you guys know the stat on how many draft picks? And this is kind of a cross sport. This isn't just the NHL. What percentage of draft picks actually uh, pan out to have a career? Well, from what I understand, there was a stat in Ontario based on the birth year, 78 birth year in Ontario. I can't remember how many people. It was something like 20,000 kids. Right. Um, 78 year birth year. Um, and out of that, there were only nine right. that played um, one game in the NHL. There was something like five that played over a hundred. And right. then there was three that were, um, that were under six feet or something like that. Right. Or some, some, something like that. So it was, it, it's very, and, and the odds of anybody playing, like it's, what 900 players play a year. Well, here's the deal. Here's the deal. I, I, I've always said this. I don't, I don't, I'm not saying you're saying this. If, if it's a kid's yeah. dream to play there, they have the right to that dream. And, and I'm not going to ever tell a kid he can't pursue the dream, but this is the stat. 50% of professional draft picks pan out 50%. Half of the picks in the draft are not mm -hmm. going to play in the NHL or have a career. Mm -hmm. What I love about your story. And this is, this is what I think you're getting at is you said it, everybody has that kind of like, this is how it's done. Your dad said, find another way. Half of those guys drafted weren't going to play anyway, and you still found a way to play. So mm -hmm. the, the message I'm trying to bring to the parents and the coaches here is there is no direct path, right? Your kid does not have to be the number one draft pick in the NHL. You just have to find a way. And we're going to get to it a little later, how this is a major life lesson, right? Because I think it's amazing your pathway to get to the league, man. Like I said, I, I applaud you for it. Um, because so many people don't even ask that question, find another way. It's like, I guess that's it. I just didn't make it. Right. I, I love that you did that. So did you want to comment on that real quick before? Because I have another, yeah, I have another well, defensive question. I, I'm going to say, I'm going to say there's, there's wanters and doers in this world. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's way more wanters out there. Right. Right. Um, and there's so many people that have told me after they found out I played in the NHL, they're like, Oh, I could have made it, but I'm like, <laughs> right. Okay. I'm like, <laughs> but why? Yeah. I'm like, there's no buts. You either made it or you didn't. Um, there's, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of people that like it, it kind of, I, I kind of laugh at those because they're like, Oh, I had a girlfriend or right. There was always excuses, excuses. I, 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 I don't like excuses at all, but you got to understand. Okay. So, so I ended up having a uh, 15 years pro. So, so based on the 15 years pro, I graduated Michigan state in 2000. So 2015, I, I retired. So 2015, I retired. All the people that I went to school with ended up getting jobs. They are got promotions, managing. Now they're in the top of the business. And a lot of the guys I went to school with Michigan State, they were into the far, uh, the um, uh, pharmaceutical and, and getting into kind of uh, being in operations um, in hospitals and in getting different uh, devices in which it's, it's crap a load of money, like insane load of money. So all these people that have 
they did make the NHL and they ended up going on with their life. I got to say for the, for the odds of somebody like, like with me, I was done and finished uh, in 2015. And if I didn't have coach them in my <laughs> hockey school to fall back on, I was screwed. And a lot of people are, are, are very um, tough, uh, T- tough times uh, when they retire. Um, you know, some people don't go and manage their money correctly. They don't do a lot of stuff. So I'm going to say if I was to do it again, yes, I would, I would love to be able to play in the NHL, but if I had a choice between the two, I don't know. I don't know. Like it's, it's, it's awesome. It's great to be in the NHL, but, but it, it's almost like, it's not like you are a plumber that goes and, loses the job and goes to another one you're in the nhl and when you go and retire from the nhl you're retiring at a younger age i retired at age what 35 so you're retiring at a younger age that you have the rest of your life till your pension at 60 so you have another 25 years to make it there so it, it's it's kind of if you think about it, all these parents they're trying to get their kid, yes, yeah, better life, better life. But I'm like, I'm gonna say, the odds of making it are slim to none. Somebody has to make it. But if you are able to um, give your your kid the chance and, and educate them and just be like, you're preparing for you're preparing for hockey season every year and then that's what happens all these all these kids are preparing for the hockey season they're they're going and working on their shot working on do you know what you should be going and working on your schoolwork you should be going and working on 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 um like even when when you're playing in the in in pro you should be going and 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 working at after that post-career like there's so many things that you guys could the kids could be doing along the way and and you're not screwed later on um, after you're done your career it, it's it's very tough I've, I've been through a lot of um uh discussions with uh a former nhl and pro it's it's very it's very t- tough that's that's the bad side of it <laughs> mike don't you think don't you think that bit by playing okay so we're, you're playing a youth sport right and you're in your case hockey and, and get to go to you know get to go to university and I think having that structure and that and that piece in place where, you know, I think a lot of like the, the parents that I advise and the kids that I work with, you know, they always, you know, everybody's like, when's the next tournament? When's the next game? When are we can play five games this weekend? When can we, you know, and if I said, well, you know what, we're going to spend a little bit of money. We're going to learn. We're going to learn all about nutrition. We're going to learn about time management. We're going to learn about how to finance, you know, how to manage your money you know, how to earn, you know, what, what the cost of a stick is, you know, you're, you're 265 for a stick. What is that really? What's the value of that? Like, what am I doing as a parent to give you that value? Like, we don't do any of that with these kids. It's all about, you know, where can I get the next exposure camp? And I think there's so many other things that go into place about what we're teaching our kids that the byproduct of all of it, if they do, if we do it all right, and your kids like uh, uh, has something God given to them. Yeah. You get to play in the NHL, but if you don't get to get to play in the NHL, Think about all the, the great pieces and lessons that you now have that you can now manage your life for, for success. And I think you're, you're, you're alluding to that, right? Your, your teammates or your classmates, they weren't there on you know, hockey scholarships and NHL contracts. They were there, but, but learning the same lessons that you had and that you just, you just maybe, I guess, in, in a weird way, took a longer path to get to your professional career outside the NHL. Yeah, well, there's there's a lot of life lessons. The, the 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 game of hockey is pretty powerful if you if you if you take the time to go and understand it. So so we're on the ice and there's five guys. All right, five guys, and you have uh, a coach, let's say your boss, that basically is instructing what to do. So you're taking what that that that's that that plan of action and as five individuals from different backgrounds possibly different languages you're trying to go and put that together and and with this little rubber thing we call a puck and and we're we're trying to go and put it by this guy standing or girl standing in the net this net with with pillows we call pads it's a silly game we play 
but there's a lot of things that 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 it teaches you and a lot of people don't realize it it teaches you how to go and work together with other people um and and it teaches you that if you don't improve you're going to get cut just like business if you're not good at your job you're going to get you're going to get fired somebody's going to replace you um going in and really uh Focusing on improvement uh, with your health, with it, it teaches you so much, like putting stuff in your body that is going to help you perform in the game is huge. I, I had a lot of structure. I ended up going to bed at 8.30 at night because I had a game the next day. Uh, some kids I coach, they're up to like 2 a.m. It's crazy. So so understanding that that it's it's waking up and, and doing push-ups and sit-ups before before you go to school, not because your parents told you, but be, because you want to. And, and that's that whole lifestyle thing that I'm, I, that I'm talking about because the li- lifestyle, um, it goes and transitions to post-career if you go and get into the right lifestyle. The like the the drive, I love I love ex athletes as as employees. Um, I, I think they're driven. They 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 love working together with the team, and I think that they are. Um, well, and, and coach them's they're 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 obviously have that that sports background. So, but but I'm just a lot of a lot of people don't realize that this game is is bigger than putting that 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 rubber thing in the net. Yeah. You know, we say it again all the time, hockey or sport is a vehicle for your growth as a human being. You know, one of my favorite statements, and this is true. It's not a negative statement. It's just true. All roads lead to adult league. All of them. (laughs) doesn't matter if you play 20 years in the NHL or you never play all roads lead to adult league. And I I think what we're trying to express to the parents and the coaches here, and and look, look, Mike, we always get a lot of nods when we talk about this, but for it to really set in, it's, you know, how much time are we spending as parents and coaches really making the kids understand that while you love this game, you play this game, you give it all to the game. You also have to be understanding that your education is insanely important, that building skill sets outside of the game is insanely important. And that the, the game the gift of the game outside playing it is what you just said, the tools it's giving you to be part of society. Right. I, I totally agree that you can tell when you work with someone who's never been on a team and ever, you can tell they, they have a hard time dealing with adversity. They might be antisocial. And again, not that these are bad traits, right. They're just the realistic outcome of not sitting in a locker room of people for most of your life. Right. So I, I you know, look, I was very blessed in a sense of, um, I kind of knew what field I wanted to get into, even in high school, right? And and I, I tell parents all the time, I was lucky that I knew, you know, I love broadcasting and writing. Like I just knew it. That, that's that was that was my quote unquote backup plan if hockey didn't work out, right? Uh, and it's okay if your kids don't know what they want to do when they're 17 years old, even at 21 years old, right? But you do need to know that you have a future you have to plan for. And you know that actually brings us to this question. We talked about this before the show. Um, and, and I purposely had you not answer it, but uh, let's just say, you know, you're younger and I'll let you pick the locker room. It can be the solar bears. It can be AHL. It can be your first game with the thrashers. Right. But if you could send a text to your younger self, right. What would it be? Well, I would probably say I was, I was in a position to get, um, to get into closed doors that, that most people couldn't. Uh, being on that platform of playing in the NHL. And, and, and I think that that is a huge advantage. Um, having, I ended up coming late into the, the uh, Twitter and um, Instagram world. I wish I would have did a little bit sooner than that, but obviously being with Montreal Canadians and my, my Twitter feed went from, uh, t- uh, 2000 to 20, I think it's like 38,000 within, within minutes, right. uh, when I got traded there. So it was pretty, it was pretty cool, but I would have gone and taken a little bit more advantage of, um, uh, 
uh, Twitter and Instagram. And, and now it's evolved so much. It's, it's, it's absolutely massive. So I think, I think something like that, um, I, 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 I pretty much did almost everything. Like I, while while people were on the plane losing money at the poker table, I was designing websites and I create was creating Coach Them. So I was always preparing for after. Uh, I, I ended up creating defense first during that time too. So I was I was always preparing for after. Um, if I was to do it again, I probably would have. With every single city I was in, I would have probably have bought the house and I would have rented it out after I got traded or I moved right. to another city because that house would be worth a lot more money now. Um, but I, I think I think I was always worried about the next thing. I was always wor- worried that I wasn't going to be ready for, for that. And that helped me prepare for on ice but it also helped me prepare for after um, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of people don't realize that the summertime, a lot of pro guys come back and they're preparing all these kids are preparing, working out and going on the ice and training, but they're not going in preparing for, for post career going in and find a local business that you're interested in and stop by and like, Hey, I would love to learn. And go and after you're done working out, go over there. You, you like you it, because you, you're gonna have a job uh, for after. And a lot of people are like, oh, I'm gonna make the NHL. I'm never gonna have to work again in, in my life. But why wouldn't you want to learn yeah, work? Go insane if you don't have this. Already. <laughs> yeah, like, it, like, <laughs> I, think like that, I think that's a I think that's a real microcosm, right? Too of of us as youth hockey coaches and and allowing our players and encouraging them. To, to to share what they do outside right. of like my only question can't be hey did you shoot today hey did you work on your stick handling today hey did you work on your skating today it's got hey i heard you learn how to play in the guitar or hey you know i i learned that i, I heard that you're really you know great at monopoly and you and you, you 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 mastered the monopoly board and you know how to you know buy properties and manage the money and, and you're beating everyone up like it's so much easier for us as coaches to just say, hey, the easy low hanging fruit, right? Hey, did you do your stick handling today? You're not going to get better if you don't stick handle. But instead, encouraging our players that 99.99% aren't going to play in the NHL to always be looking for the next thing to be involved in. Because one of the things that I see, especially you know, 17, 18 year olds, is that is that that instant it ended, it's over. You just played your last game, and you have nothing else. You've done nothing else but hockey. Like you have no other identity, no, but hockey. Kids. And yeah. it's so sad. And it's not a couple of kids. It's, it's most of the kids it's because we put this, everybody. we put this ultra, like there is no other plan other than playing. And well, we all, and, and, and I think, and I think it's so, you know, it's crazy, right? Cause we have to be able to be able to say, listen, I produce to your point, Mike. I mean, look, like I was talking to uh, Mike knows Tim Bothwell and, and, and Tim's a, you know, a great, you know, mentor coach. And when he talks about a guy like Mike Weaver, he doesn't talk about Mike Weaver, the defenseman at all. It didn't even come up. Maybe, maybe, maybe there's reasons. I don't know, but, but, <laughs> but there's, but it's, it's all about who he is, what he did, what kind of person he is, what kind of teammate right. he was, what kind of locker room guy he was, what kind of, you know, all, everything else except for, Oh, his skating and shooting and passing. It, had no, it, it didn't even come up. It's like, wow, how successful is this human being? And I was a part of that. And I think we have to look at that more and more. Yeah. And I, I like to, when I have that 30 minutes with my, my um, hockey school uh, clients, um, just to kind of go over different topics, I, I talk to them. I'm like, well, one of the biggest things, you, you're so young. You got to look at your life as a painter. So you're a painter. You have this blank canvas. And you have all these amazing um, bright colors uh, of, of um, bright reds, yellows, and, and those are positive. Those are positive um, colors that when you, when you go and hold the door for somebody, um, help uh, an elderly person across the street, uh, do great on your test. Those are swatches on this canvas 
that are all positive, amazing colors. But then you got the grays and blacks and browns and just the slosh. Um, and those are going to be the negative things. You go and cheat. You 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 skip school. Um, you you tell somebody off. Like there's there's a lot of things that right. But every so often you're allowed to look back at this campus and you're like, do I like it or not? Do I like it or not? And and it's something that you're able to go and switch it, but you can't just take the bright colors and throw it on the canvas. It, it goes and happens over time and it's one stroke at a time. And that's kind of one of the things I, I've, I've really trying to make it a habit that, that everybody's, everybody's just a soul in a body, in a vessel that is walking around and, what are you going to do? Uh, you're on this, the average age is 79 years. You're on this, this, this life in, for 79 summers. Isn't that crazy? So 79 summers, what do you, uh, that, that is, that is kind of crazy that if you put it in perspective and, and I, I think it comes to, if you focus too much on one thing that is, not, not, not the best. Um, uh, Ron Mason, uh, my, was, was my coach at Michigan state. Uh, he came into my living room when he was recruiting me and he said, he's just like, Mike, you got to look at life as, uh, as a triangle. You got your, you got your hockey and sports at the bottom. You got your social life. Um, and then you got your, then you got your schooling and education. Now, each, this is a triangle, and it's perfectly, every single side is uh, the same length. Now, if, now, if you're part of it too much, right, it's going to get a little bigger on this one, and it's going to be off balance, right? If you are study, studying too much, sometimes you could study too much, right? It's all about balance in life, and that's one thing with me. I, I, I struggle all the time with coach them, and it's all about balance. It's all about re reevaluating at what point you're at. Do you like, do you like your life or not? Do you like the path that you're going? And it's all about, you have to look at yourself in the mirror. And I look at myself all the time in the mirror. And what do you see? Do you like it or not? You you're able to change whatever you're able to do. Right. Um, it's so. Mike, you know, both mics, got two mics on today. Uh, one of the points that you're both making that I love is this, you know, Mike, you talked about when you figured out the game, remember you talked about that early in the episode about seeing it from a different point of view. I mm. remember, cause it was like hockey was my life. Right. I remember that when I was 18 hockey is my life. And, and I remember the day I realized, wow, I can apply the same passion and work ethic to other things. And it's funny because, you know, I tell people that story sometimes I go, well, yeah, of course. But when you're so ingrained in the hockey life and hockey's all you care about, it can be tough to see that. Mike uh, Benelli, that's what you were talking about, right? There's just one path and it's just hockey. And to be fair, look, it's on coaches, it's on parents and the kids to a point to make sure that you're broadening their horizons and letting them see that there's more out there than just the game, right? Um, and I've heard parents say this, well, yeah, good luck telling my kid that. But they're listening. They're listening. They might not be acknowledging, but they're listening to you, right? My parents, I, I said this in another episode, again. My, 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 my parents always told me you have to have a backup plan for hockey. They knew that was the actual plan. I didn't know it, but they knew it. So my point, my, and, and Mike, you've totally championed this in a lot of different ways, is that the, the approach you took to hockey was not limited to hockey right? The, the, the thing your dad said to find another way. It, you don't, you don't only apply that to just hockey. And, and I think that that's a really important point to bring up is the skill sets you learn in hockey. And I'm not talking about wrist shots right now. The skill sets you learn about working together, hard work, overcoming adversity, trusting in someone else. It's a value set that you can apply to other things. Mike, I do another show called life after the military in which I interview veterans transitioning out of the military. It's funny, the stories that you're saying are very, very similar. Here's people that have been in a career, right? They're about 40 years old. They've only known the military life. It ends and they have to transition out. And they don't know what to do. And everybody else their age is already well-established in an industry. And they have a very hard time transitioning out. That's why we do that show. 
to, to give the tips and tricks. Right. So I just think, you know, what we tell them, and it's the same thing to hockey players and Mike Benelli again, whether you're 18 or 40, right. It's, you got to be able to know a, how to talk to people, how to network, right. That's one of the big things in the military show network ahead of time, talk to people, experience other work. Right. And above all, know that you're coming out with a skill set. And by the way, the hockey skill set and the military skill set are very similar team player, right. Accountability. Know you have that as an asset and apply it. And look, again, you applied it, right. You applied it. We said at the top of the show, you created coach them, Dot com uh, with Rob Tallis, again, retired NHL goalie and, and, and active NHL goalie coach. So tell us what spawned you to create Coach Them, because uh, it's a really awesome tool. Again, CoachThem.com for anybody listening. It's not a sponsored segment or anything like that. It's just a resource, obviously. Um, I went there. I love it because it encourages creativity. And you said it was born out of a frustration you had, you know, coaching your school. So tell us about CoachThem.com. You can, you can go as far into it as you want. Yeah, so it started – it started with um, just frustrations with my hockey school, as I mentioned before. And I ended up, I ended up going and just figuring out a way of doing it. And that's kind of what I did with my hockey career. I figured out another way. So it's completely web-based. It allows coaches to digitally create their drills instead of drawing the same drill over and over and over again. And from there, they're, once that drill is done and they take an extra 10 minutes to, to make um, that drill absolutely perfect. Once that drill is done, they're able to easily click to add their drills to their practice plan. So they're able to stay organized, allows their coaching staff to stay on the same page. And we've had a crazy amount of associations uh, sign up. We have about a hundred and. 130 140 associations now on coach them wow. which is pretty which is pretty crazy um we usually have a minimum of about eight eight teams on there so we have some of the biggest associations uh, that have 50 uh 60 teams on there so it's been it's been pretty amazing and benelli this whole entire time has been a very a uh, big supporter of us because he just loves the way that he uh, it, it's so easy to create drills and plans. And he has this amazing uh, station based plan right on coach them called the St. Louis um, skill, skill of night, uh, night of skills. And on there with each um, skill set that St. Louis is on there, he has a video corresponding to, uh, St. Louis doing it in a game, which is pretty amazing. So what Benelli has created was just, just awesome. So that, that is a really, really amazing, um, asset that we have Benelli a part of basically, uh, coach them. So it's been, it's been amazing. I, I've honestly, I love all our coaches every day. They're saying, how amazing it is! How easy is it, is it to create their the the plans? We've our users have created about over five hundred and ten thousand uh, drills on there. It's been it's been crazy. Yeah, yeah. So. I think it, com- it, com- it comes up a lot with our discussions here, Mike. Is is you know how can coaches and parents and and players have more synergy, right? How do we communicate to these people better? And I found you know using Coach Them and platforms like Coach Them allow allow you to communicate with your players and parents. I call it like giving the kids the answers to the test. Right. And I know at the youth hockey level where I coach mostly it's, I want not only the kids to have the answers to the test and understand my thought process. And I can do that through my, the shareability feature on your platform, but the parents are the ones really reading that, right. They're the ones seeing it first. They're the ones printing it out and they get to see what I'm trying to teach. So they start to understand why is this Benelli guy doing soccer uh, in the corner because the, because I can write down what the drill is, why we're doing it, the key points and what we're teaching. I mean, Mike, uh, Mike and I, we, uh, so this is where I am fortunate, right? Mike, my, I'm, I'm driving home a couple of days ago. Mike Weaver, you know, <laughs> makes a phone call. We're talking about something else. I got my son in the car. I'm like, Mike here, we have a dilemma here. I'm trying to teach our, my defensemen how to make, how to catch passes in their feet. Right. And my Mike was, you know, pretty honest. He said, well, number one is, teach your other defensemen how to pass the damn puck, right? You know, so, stop making bad passes. But since we have a lot of, like, there's a lot of opportunity there for teaching. Like, the, I always I always revert to, okay, what is the problem? What's the solution? 
And then what's the easiest way for me to share that solution? And that's where Mike Weaver comes in for me because it allows me to take these pieces and say, okay, I'm going to develop a drill that happens every day in games. I'm going to, I'm going to replicate it in a negative way over and over and over again in practice. And then literally that weekend, we got to see it in, in, in its truest form in a correct way. And the players were able to correct it. And it was all because of the, you know, it was all because of the way we were able to share it, discuss it, share it again, put video in, use it on the ice. And more importantly, I think than anything else, have the kids understand the key points of what we were trying to teach that it wasn't just a drill that it wasn't just, okay, go through the motions. X goes right. here. Y goes there. X goes here. But what were we teaching? And then how can we implement that in a game situation? And I think that's why it's so important to have these assets available to all of us as coaches because we can share it with our players and our parents and, and ultimately improve our teams. Yeah. Um, one of the things I wanted to say, uh, if you go and use uh, the coupon M, M is in Mike, B is in Benelli, HS. So M, B, H, S, you can get 10% off at Coach Them. I, I know that's a little uh, plug there. Um, and then, and then also, um, we, Benelli and I have created a, a webinar. It's basically for, it's called the creation series. So if you go to coachthem.com, go to the blog, it's a creation series, which we're going to be creating amazing drills. And uh, it's going to be, it's going to be pretty, I, I, I had a lot of fun on our first episode, but you could go there and check it out. But also on there, you're able to go and book time with Benelli. Cause I'm telling you some of the times I didn't have an, uh, I didn't have a, a practice plan and I was having issues with my team. I called Benelli up and him and I worked through an amazing practice plan and my, my kids absolutely loved it. So I actually use them too. So yeah, it's we pretty... and, Lee and, and Lee and I do it. This is what's great about the podcast, right? How it kind of spurned this podcast. Cause we're, I think we have better, I think some of our conversations are great off the recording, like just saying, what are you doing with that eight U team? Or how are you teaching that? Or what's the concepts? And the cool thing is like, I was so tired of like, okay, I'm going to go. And, and this is like dating myself. Right. But even when I'm talking to coaches back in the day, I'm faxing them the lesson plan. I'm writing it down. I'm trying to take a picture of it with my phone to share a drill. It's like, this is like the collaboration again, for nothing else, it allows all of us as coaches to communicate so much more. And I think when you communicate with other coaches, it just makes you a better coach because we all ultimately steal drills from each other. And then we can, then we get, we got to manipulate the drill. We got to say, I love what I saw there. Now I can, I was on, I was at, at a LIU game the other day with Dave Starman and we were watching a uh, practice and Dave's, Dave's been a contributor with Mike uh, for a number of things. And I'm sitting there, uh, with Dave going, wow, did you see how that play happened there? Or where that goes? I, I really like that concept. And then we're sitting there, you know, literally on the iPad on coach them drawing like the drills and say, okay, this is the next drill we're going to use for our team. And it's right there. And then it's shareable to both of us. It's not like we didn't forget it. It wasn't on a bar napkin. It wasn't, you know, on the back of uh, a scouting report. It was right there to use for virtually ever. And I think that's the kind of cool piece of this is what we, really gets me you know, excited about what Mike's technology is and what his thought process was is because I can't imagine going to a hockey school and reinventing my drills every single day right. now, right. the way I am now. Yeah. And, and for our listeners, so you just heard uh, Mike Benelli's full out New York drawing accent there, which was awesome. <laughs> for those of you listening, it's drawing. drawing. No, it's okay. But no, I, I, I love it. You know, Mike, just, just rounding out this episode, you know, I love that again, you had to tell him a communications degree and, and you're using it. Right. And, and you really understood how to manipulate that. The other thing I love about coach them.com. And, and again, I, I told you this story before. I remember I went to a, to a, like a, co a coaching summit one time and the guy leading the summit said, well, none of you really create your own drills anyway. You just kind of follow whatever you're given. And man, that that pissed me off. I, yeah, I did yeah. create my own drills. And, and look, nothing wrong with borrowing or Mike, as you said, stealing drills. Nothing wrong with that. We learn when we grow together. But I like to be creative. I like to be creative about the drills that I'm creating. And, and Mike, you've created a platform that allows coaches to do that. Um, so Mike, both Mike's actually, I have to ask this question because I'm going to get yelled at by my, my uh, fellow coaches on my team. As I said to you, Mike, I'm, I'm coaching eight you for the first time ever, ever. I always coached high levels and now I'm doing coach, coaching at you. Um, what do we tell those kids about defense? Again, we, we, we've explained them the basic concept of the house in front of the net and how we have to protect it and everything. 
but from both of you, what what is your tips for that young? You know, we'll use the old terms here, might squirt level, maybe a little bit of peewees. What are the foundations, uh, foundations, foundations, you can tell I'm teaching young kids, uh, about defense that we should be teaching. And it's not just get the puck, get it out. Like that's, I hear that a lot, you know, in a game. Oh, so Mike's answer. So Mike's answer is over already. So go ahead, Mike. You can go <laughs> no, that's right. Benelli, get go, the go damn puck it. off the glass. Get, get it, it off the glass. <laughs> go for it, Benelli. You got it. No, so I have one, one teaching concept that I've used now for the last couple of years, which I think is gold. And I just, I line my kids up, all my players. And I put, I draw a V with my magic marker on the ice off their skates, like just a big V. And I'm like, and I'm like, if you can keep your stick within this V, you're, you're, that's the fundamental piece of where you need to be with your body, right? The minute the stick gets outside the V or across the V, now you're in a really bad place with, with the blade of your stick. And the kids see it. I think little kids, especially, they need to see that. They need to see that line coming out from just like when we work with goaltenders about, you know, the angle machines and showing goaltenders like how the angle changes as you move out and in. The kids need to see if my, if my stick is always within this V, uh, whether on my backhand or my forehand, I'm going to have great success because I can control, to Mike's point earlier, where the door is opening and where the door is closing. And I think that little piece of visualization I would, I would use with every single one of my youth players at every level. Mike, turn over to yeah. you too. Yeah. Okay. That well, is gold. I always like to ask the kids if if a person, a player is right there, I ask them what they would do, first of all. A lot of people are like, I want to get the puck. I'd be like, okay, well, let's go in. Let's go. We want to go and get that player over to here. So that is the plan that you should have. And a lot of kids don't realize that. And it's it's simple as showing them. I, I have a simple drill on um, coach them, and it's uh, it's I gotta just figure out the exact one it is, but it's an angling drill. It's in the marketplace, but it's it's a really good. The eight use lo- love it, and it's just a, a little. It's gonna it's it's in the neutral zone, and it's just basically coming around the top of the circles, and you're trying to get them into that one area and i show them your goal is to get that player to basically the blue line just before the blue line right against the boards and that's and i would just walk them through exactly how we're going to do that based on your stick positioning and your body placement and i'm going to say the first time doing the drill 20 percent got it if we did it, it, it i would stop it the second part of the drill it would be about 50%. And I'm going to say probably about 60 to 70% by the t- time we're done with that drill, a lot of them get that. And, and, and it's, it's just, it's just the concept of you have a plan in place every single time. You're not, you're not a dog chasing a tennis ball because that's what a lot of players do. They go and chase that tennis ball and it's all about taking back the control. So that's a great answer, guys. Thank, thank you. And I, I will bring that back to my EU team. I'm going to go on coachthem.com and find that drill because yeah. it's something we, we need to work on. Again, team, team's good. They, they, they listen as much as eight-year-olds can, and I always appreciate them for that. But, Mike, look, I really appreciate you sharing uh, your journey, your thoughts, uh, your website, everything with us today. This has really been a great episode. A lot of, lot of information in it uh, for the parents and coaches that listen, but a lot of value, man. So thank you so much for being here. Awesome. Thanks. Thank, thank you so much for having me, guys. No, it's been our pleasure. So, Mike, unless you have any other final words. No, you- I'm good. I'm like, like I said, yeah. Mike's a great resource to, 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 to listen to. I mean, he does a lot of stuff with the coaches site. He does a lot of stuff with his own website. He does a bunch of you always see him on podcasts. And and I know with the Project Hockey guys, he's joining in there. So anytime you get little nuggets of, of Mike Weaver, I would definitely listen, take them and, and, and use them with your parents and your players. I think it's a uh, you know, I think it's a great resource for us to have at the youth hockey level for sure. I love it. Mike Weaver's with us today. Again, check it out. Coachthem.com. That's his website. It is a tremendous resource. Highly, highly recommended by Mike Bennell. Highly recommended. What was that code again, Mike Weaver? Uh, it was MBHS. So Mike Bennelli Hockey Solutions. Yeah. 
at, yeah, at there you so. get 10 percent off and there's your, your free ad for the day even though this isn't a paid segment which is totally okay listen <laughs> our kids play hockey that's going to do it for this episode i'm lee elias that's mike benelli that's mike weaver thanks so much for listening uh, remember you can hear this episode and all the episodes we've ever done at our kids play or wherever podcasts are heard we're literally everywhere thanks so much for your time and we'll see you next week everybody take care